Welcome back. We're going to talk now about antitrust law. And specifically, I'm going to talk about the rise of Standard Oil, the company that John D. Rockefeller created right after the Civil War, from the 1860s to the 1890s, when it became the largest dominant oil company in America with 90% of the market. And it eventually made him the wealthiest American of all time. Rockefeller was an itinerant kid, but he grew up in Cleveland, where he worked for a long time at a produce company as a young man. And he was pretty good at calculating things like the transportation costs and negotiating with shippers. He realized that as he talked to the freight agents and the ship captains and the barge owners, he realized, well, there were no such things as standard rates. He could cut deals. He could say, okay, I'll sell in bulk, but you give me a better deal than my competitors. And he got rebates from preferred shippers as well. In 1863, Civil War is still going on. Uh, he builds an oil refinery in Cleveland. And other oil refineries used about 60% of what they produced. And it took the gasoline, remember the car hadn't been invented quite yet, dumped the gasoline in the river, the Cayuga River in this case, famous for once catching on fire because of what the oil refineries did. Uh, but John D. Rockefeller was really good at being efficient. So he used the gasoline to help uh, provide the energy for his business. He created paraffin and wax and, and uh, all sorts of you know, lubricating oil, petroleum jelly, bought companies. So he became much more efficient. He made it less expensive. And this is at the time when the industrial age is growing, the car is growing. And I often talk about how innovation occurs when two or three innovations happen at once, like the computer and the microchip and the internet all happen at once. Well, in this case, you had the rise of the industrial revolution with machinery and factories. You had the rise of the oil industry with John D. Rockefeller and Standard Oil. And you had eventually the rise of the auto industry with Henry Ford. And what Rockefeller did was he standardized oil. So you knew when you were buying a gallon of oil or a barrel of oil, it would be standard quality. And so he called it the Standard Oil Company. He also decided that he was gonna dominate the market and he did it by practices that were both legal and some of them skirted the edge of the law, but there wasn't really a clear law at the time. He did it by buying a lot of his competitors, sometimes shutting them down if they were inefficient, by demanding bulk discounts from the railways, he got a 70% discount at one point. Also demanding that the railways that ship with him didn't give discounts to his competitors. And he was ended up able to cut the cost of kerosene, which was a product most people bought from him by half. So this helped consumers, but it also hurt competitors. And that's what antitrust law has to balance. After a while, he controlled 90% of the refining and sales of oil in America. And he did it by building up trusts, meaning that not only did he buy a lot of companies, he took over quietly and sometimes secretly a lot of companies by making them put their stock into a trust. And then there would be a board of trustees that he controlled that would vote the shares and control all of these companies. So that's where we get the word trust because the stock in these companies were put in trust and controlled by John Rockefeller. So he begins up uh, uh, horizontally uh, creating an industry, meaning buying up a lot of other refineries, but also trying to create dominance vertically, which means he bought not only the refinery, but the freight cars, the pipelines, the home delivery network, the gas stations that eventually popped up on the corners. And he kept prices low to stave off competitors, uh, which made the product affordable to most people. But it also increased his market penetration 
And sometimes he would sell below cost. He'd say, well, why is that bad? It helps the consumer. It's called predatory pricing. He would do it not just to help the consumer or not at all to help the consumer, but to make sure that a competitor trying to get into the market would be put out of business. He saw himself as the industry's, quote, angel of mercy, he said. He absorbed the weak, made the industry stronger, more competitive, more efficient. But the New York world called him the most cruel, impudent, pitiless, and grasping monopoly that ever fastened upon a country. In other words, he was controversial. And in the end, we have to deal with this controversy. Talk about Standard Oil, there were a whole lot of political cartoons in the day, all of them using, not all of them, but most of them using the metaphor of the octopus. That's what these trusts began to uh, be depicted as, with tentacles that would capture all sorts of industries, including the refining and the uh, marketing and the shipping industry, but also it would put its tentacles, as you can see in the upper left, around the capital of the United States, around the White House. He helped support the election of McKinley, President McKinley, and so he had political control. The question we have to answer in antitrust law is, uh, he did a lot of harm uh, to competitors, but he didn't do a lot of harm to consumers. As I said, the price went down. And so what is the purpose of antitrust law? Now, there hasn't been a big antitrust law yet. We're going to get to that next. That doesn't happen until the Sherman Antitrust Act. Uh, but uh, what would be the purpose? Is it simply to help consumers? Or does government have an interest in protecting competition, allowing the market to have a lot of competitors in it for the long run, even if it doesn't help consumers in the short run, is part of the law just to protect competition in the marketplace. We're still debating, there's no simple answer to that, but when we get to the Sherman antitrust law, we'll see that both concepts were enshrined into the law, including also a little dose of what a guy named Louis Brandeis was preaching at the time. He eventually becomes a great advisor to President Woodrow Wilson, and then on the Supreme Court, and he preached the doctrine that he called the curse of bigness. And he felt that companies shouldn't harm consumers. They also shouldn't harm competitors. And that if they got too big, that was bad. So all of those elements go into antitrust law and they're still being debated.